Hi, everyone, and welcome to Converge 2021. Before we start our session, I would like to share a short story with you. So my wife and I have been thinking about getting an RV for a while now. Um, we've been always traveling, going camping with my daughter and really enjoy the nature. Uh, and we decided, I think it's time for an upgrade and really enjoy some of the luxuries of, of camping. Uh, so we've been talking about it for a while. Uh, last year, we spent almost a year uh, cooked up in a house, working in, in, a, in a home office, uh, unable to, to really do anything. And we decided it's probably a good time to make that move. So I did a research earlier this year, went to the shows, looked at all the different amenities and, and different choices. And, and we finally make a decision, made a decision and picked up an RV in May of this year. It was first RV that I ever owned. I picked it up in, in Tampa, Florida, and we had to drive all the way back home to South Florida. And I don't know how many of you ever drove in South Florida, but it was very, very uh, stressful, uh, especially for me driving the first time, driving a huge RV going so back. So the RV that you own, is it the last? <laughs> it remains to be seen. We'll see. But it, it was definitely an experience and, and probably, you know, lost a few years of my life there in that first trip. We got home, we were still very excited. So even with all the stress and everything, we we're very excited <clears throat> and we planned our first trip. So that was, that happened in August of this year. We planned a huge, big trip all the way up north, different states, you know, I, I did the research. I read all the manuals that the RV came with. So it was a nice pile and I thought I was ready. And then we went off uh, for a trip and things didn't go as planned <laughs> right away. Our first uh, stop, things broke down. I, I didn't even know who to call. Uh, simple things as hitching and unhitching the, the RV really didn't, didn't seem as easy as, as it was in the, in the, in the instructions. Uh, and, and there was a little tricks that, that I learned along the way. And also watching everyone around, uh, the tools, the different, uh, different accessories that they had to make just the experience better. And I think when I think about that experience, uh, you know, I, I, if I was better prepared, if I, if I had a better understanding what to expect, what, what are the unexpected things that I should expect, um, I think I'll be better prepared and enjoy that experience. And if I look at our micro journey here at Citrix, uh, you know, considering that a brand new technology when we started, a new concept, uh, you know, I think I, back then we were able to, to understand some of, the, some of the challenges, some of the roadblocks, some of the things to consider I think it would have made the journey much better. So today we want to cover that, that story with you and give you some pointers. So my name is Martin Simon. I'm a director of workspace and microop services here at Citrix. I also have Chris Strauss joining me today in our session. He did all the heavy lifting. So, so he's going to go into, into the details and some of the implementation um, gotchas and tips uh, as we go through this, through this session. So what we're going to cover today, uh, we're going to review the, our journey, our, our micro journey here at Citrix that we started last year. Um, and we're going to go through th three different phases. We're going to review first, we're going to start with the planning and touch a few topics and few areas that you need to consider before you start the implementation. Then we're going to move on to the implementation phase uh, where we're going to talk about specific things that work, didn't work, some of the adjustments that we, need, we needed to make. And then we're going to cover some of the optimization, continuous improvement that we're doing, because this project is, is just never never ends. You continue to improve, continue to, to, to evolve the solution. So we're going to cover those three areas um, and give you some pointers there. So let's let's start. Let's start with, a, with the first phase, which is planning. It. All right. Our planning, the project, as I mentioned, started early 2000. We had a goal of developing a microop ecosystem and, and, and solution for, for Citrix, right? But one thing before we really were able to really move forward with and start the development, we, need to, we needed to make some decision. So first, we needed to decide on the key players and really assemble the team that is able to deliver it. For in our case, we decided um, to organize and create a dedicated agile team for this purpose. We took some individuals from other teams with a background in web development, integration, and the BI, and an assembly within dedicated Agile team. We also worked with shared services, uh, QA shared services, to help us with some of the QA activities during the project. 
we had our workspace admin dedicated team that already supported workspace and we kind of extended their responsibility to also support micro apps. And then we also work with Office of Transformation. So this is our team that helps us with the adoption um, and communication and org readiness across the board. The next thing, once we establish a team and kind of agree, we have to establish some of the, some of the main uh, foundational pieces, the governance, the, the technical foundation that allow us to move forward. Um, when it comes to governance, we needed to decide who can develop the micro apps, who's going to be deploying those micro apps. How do you gain access uh, to the platform? Because if you think about it, if you look at uh, micro app, that's an extension of system of record and all the data that it's that belongs there. So we need to make some decisions as far as, you know, the, and put controls into place to ensure that the right access is given to the right individuals. I mean, we had a session with the data privacy security teams to identify the type of data and the processes that we needed to put in place to, to support it. Another thing we had to do is it's really focus on the, on the target audience. I mean, we supported the generic use cases around managers and just employees. But we also wanted to do, go a little bit deeper with a with a target audience of sales. So we've identifying some groups within within sales and specific roles within that organization, and engage them to create an early adopter group, go through the journey uh, mapping, and identify the the potential use case that they can uh, see value in. Some of the key takeaways uh, from that exercise and from from the planning phase. It's really defining the objectives, the success metrics, and overall governance up front. Uh, usually when we talk about the governance, you know, we think that slows down things. Uh, but I think it's also important, it, if we didn't have that in place, it would prevent us from moving fast. Um, also, the success metrics, what are we looking at, the, the usage, the adoption uh, that, that we're looking for, and a clear toll gate that we're looking for us to move forward with our implementation. For us, it was a guest score. It was the usage uh, and also number of defects and, and things that we had identified during that time. Another important piece, if I look at the planning, um, and we spent a lot of time on that, is really engaging the system and business owners across the organization, right? It's, it's again, it's an extension of the process, extension of their technology, and they need to be engaged from, from the beginning. It's very hard to bring them at the end. Um, so the earlier you do that, do that uh, the earlier you communicate and engage them uh, the more successful you're going to be. The last piece, and I think, Chris, you, you can relate to that, uh, is around technical due diligence. I, we had some great use cases that, that over time we planned for. Uh, we didn't do all the due diligence, and, and we had a lot of surprises when we came to the implementation. I also feel like the planning phase was was integral to our the success of our future phases. If we didn't do this phase and really put time and effort in here, then the other phases wouldn't have been as successful. Absolutely. Yeah, so it def definitely not the from the technical perspective. I mean, we're, we're technical people here and probably not the, the most exciting phase. You know, we yep. want to get our hands dirty, but yep. but definitely, you know, if, if I look at the, the key is it's, it's around roles and responsibilities, really, and, and defining the process and, and, and roles of every team that is engaged in this in this project is very important. So let's talk. I think there was one area that, that we want to cover today around source control. So that's one of those foundational pieces that we always talked about in the planning. And, and I know we had a lot of sessions back and forth. You know, how do, how do we do it? Because there wasn't a, a really back then a good solution from the platform perspective. Yep. So let's talk about some of the, the technical foundation source control piece, which is always a fun topic to discuss among developers. So we decided to go with Azure DevOps as our source control provider. Uh, we, we chose Git repositories. Uh, we felt like that was the most robust solution to store our files. There was a couple of decisions that we had to make here um, when choosing our source control provider, um, as well as how we were gonna source these files. So when you export an integration, it comes out as a single map file. And the question we asked was, do we really want to store just a single map file? Because there's really no way to see differences in the, in the revision history. It would just be a single file stored. And that's not really what source control is for. So we made the decision to extract the, the map file and break it down into its, its smallest form, which are basically JSON configuration files, which we were able to source and 
This allowed us to implement a branching strategy. It allowed us to it allowed us to see differences in files, so file history differences, so we could see where changes were made. Uh, and it also allowed us to implement CI/CD in the future. Um, so that really was the decisions that we had when we when we faced our, our not only just our source control provider, uh, but also how we were going to source these files. Yeah, I'm definitely looking into the CI/CD and automation piece to really come come together. But w without really putting that foundation, putting some of those processes in place, it would be very difficult when the time comes. So one other thing to mention here. So the CI CD pipeline can only be as successful as the products APIs that allow you to build and deploy your, your, your map files. Um, so that's something that we, we look to leverage in the future in order to, to implement the CI CD pipeline. And we're definitely giving a lot of feedback to the, to the team, to the product, to make sure that we can support moving forward. Okay, so let's, let's move on to the implementation and, and the launch phase uh, and talk about some of the, some of the lessons learned. Uh, during that uh, during the time, so our implementation started early in 2000. Um, go live happened in, in October 2000, and definitely if I if I look at that that phase, th there was definitely quick wins um, that were able to deliver uh, fa fairly fast with minimal and uh, modifications or or changes. And we use quite a few out of the box workflows. Uh, specifically around service now, so any all, all the items related to ticket and request management, we're able to deliver it pretty fast with with minor um, uh, challenges there or, or, or issues. Uh, Ariba Concur, I think those were big hits for everyone. Uh, I know Ariba, I spoke to some some individual and they said alone Ariba provided a lot of value and they were sold on the microps. So that was a very exciting time. Also, JIRA, social course, and some of the Salesforce opportunity use cases were able to deliver um, without major modification or customization. So, so definitely, if I look back, these are the areas that, that work well and, and provide value day one. Now, also, since we're going into to more custom implementation and custom use cases, we ran into some, uh, some, some items and, and we, we had to pivot uh, and, and make some changes with the approach. Uh, one of them was API availability. We touched it on the technical feasibility. And when we started digging in, it, it just, some of the source systems didn't have the proper APIs for us to consume the data. Uh, in some cases, the data was just too big. The volume was just too big. And when we dealt with, uh, with Salesforce and accounts, uh, we had to lower and, and kind of pick which records we want. We couldn't just bring everything because the experience wasn't good. And then if you remember, we talked about targeting personas. We talked about targeting sales persona, and that sounds great from the, from the planning perspective. But then when we start going to implementation, the challenge we ran into is how do, what do we use to target those particular microps to a specific persona? How do we identify someone as ERM, PAM, you know, in, in, a, in a space? Um, and for that, you need an AD groups, which we found weren't there. So what do we do then? And we have to make some adjustments there as well. Also, one thing that, that we, we realized, there's certain use cases that um, we wanted to spend a little bit more time and really build more extensibility so we don't have to redo it over and over again. Um, and then just have more more efficiency and agility. If I if I think about system of record capabilities, uh, for instance, around Workday, uh, we try to utilize some of the notification engine within Workday to be able to just tap into that as opposed to building individual integrations for each business process. Uh, also for communication, uh, we used uh, try to extend the broadcast um, use case and and add some of the capabilities so we can onboard more and more users as we move forward. The last area was around adoption and awareness, and that wasn't necessarily a technical uh, challenge or a technical issue there, but but we had to have a solution. And actually, MyCraps and, and the platform allow us to create quickly a solution to address that. So one of the questions we had was, how do we communicate changes? How do we communicate updates? And probably sending it through email, it's not the right approach. We want to keep individuals within workspace where they work with, with the MyCraps and they consume the, the feed. So, so we invested some time, so we created some quick, easy wins, uh, which Chris is going to review and, and cover some of them. Also, simple questions as inventory, right? So how do we, where do we manage the inventory of microps? How do users get to it? How do they understand what's available and how do they request? These are some of the questions that we came across during the implementation that we need to solve for. And I think, Chris, I, I know we've created several items and several different solutions that helped us in this area throughout that phase. 
Yep, we did. We did, and the inventory micro app was a big one, a big one for our users to know what's available to them, and we'll cover that later. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, so let's let's go to specific examples, and um, if I think about one that I really want to dive a little bit deeper, it's user provider group. So I, I remember we had a lot of sessions, again, during design session, figure out how do we address the subscription, right, and targeting of the micro app. Yeah. So what did we end up doing there, Chris? So originally we we kind of looked around and and threw our hands up because we didn't have any we didn't have any Active Directory user groups that fit the personas that needed subscriptions to the micro apps that that we were creating. So for example, we didn't have specific sales groups that we needed an Active Directory. Um, some of the challenges were too we got pushback for not only cluttering up the Active Directory structure with new groups that had a specific purpose for the micro app, but also cluttering up our IT landscape because we needed to now create an integration in order to sync the, the system of records users in groups to Active Directory to keep those groups managed. So not only do we have to create them, but we also have to keep them updated. So now this is just another thing that could break. It's another thing that we had to monitor and it's another thing we had to maintain. And, and that just wasn't really a, a solution that, that we wanted to take on. So in comes user providers to save the day. <laughs> so the solution we came up with was a product feature user provider, uh, which allowed us basically to configure an integration and a synchronization job in the product that would allow the, the product to reach out to the system record and, and import all of the groups and users into the product alone. And so instead of having all this this user data in groups in Active Directory, now it exists in the products. And we can use those groups as subscriptions to the micro apps. And the great part about the user provider is it runs on a synchronization schedule. So there's no maintenance there, which is which is great. And we're definitely gonna remove uh, a lot of the PowerShell scripts and, and yep. infrastructure and dependencies on other teams, which would just created more complexity. Now it's time for a word we all love, technical debt. All right, so let's talk about Workday PTO use case. Um, and this one, this one was definitely challenging for us. And we had a different iteration that we went through. If I look at the use case itself, it's on the paper, it looks pretty straightforward. We're doing uh, time off requests. So every employee can, can submit time off requests. Uh, managers can approve. And then we have notifications for the managers for the approvals that come their way. Some of the challenges um, that, we, that we've seen uh, and we needed to solve for was around performance and data volume. Like some of the APIs that we're interacting with on the Workday side just didn't perform as we expect. And it took a long time to replicate the data uh, to and keep it up to date, right? So one of the one of the challenges we had was users complaining that their time time balances were never up to date uh, and, and always always lagging. Also, the, the notification took, took a while to show up. And, and in most cases, you know, you got it before in the email, which wasn't a good experience as well. Yeah. And then even from API limitation perspective, uh, the, the APIs that we had to interact with, they had different types of authorizations also for one simple use case, you know, that, that I described here. Uh, so, so it just added a lot of complexity that we didn't, that we didn't necessarily uh, understand before we were getting into. And we had to make some adjustment. And I know, Chris, this is the item that um, the team definitely, definitely worked on quite a bit, yep. understand the, the capability and see how, what, what we can do from the platform perspective to really uh, make some of the changes here. The first iteration of this implementation um, was, was all out of the boxes when it was also. Um, Something that we did to, to in order to kind of tackle some of those hurdles that we, we faced was we allowed users to, especially with the data, because we, we know, like Marcina had mentioned before, we know that the data loading, the amount of data in the SOR coming into, into the cache was, was a lot. And so it would take some time. These actions and notifications and, and balances, they need to be seen immediately. And so what we did was we, enabled the ability for users to fetch their their time off balances um, and time off types real time. And so real time data would be loaded into the cache. It was it was a little bit of a of a of a tricky implementation, um, but we ended up implementing it with scripting, which is available in the product. So the product allows us to write JavaScript in order to create service actions 
um, and call out to to the to the APIs uh, on the fly and wire that up to the to the buttons uh, on the on the blades. Um, that was a and that was a big win for our team because it it made it so notifications were sent out real time. It made it so we could see our time off balances and and how much time we have available to us to take off. Uh, and that was a that was a big a big win there. One of the other things that I want to mention real quick is the scripting also allowed us to transform the responses uh, from the API uh, into something that we wanted our schema to look like internally in the product. So so yeah, that was a. This this implementation was a little tricky. A little took a little bit more technical knowledge uh, as far as JavaScript is concerned than the than the previous iteration of this. As we implement new versions and as we iterate and find out what's valuable to the users, it, it enabled us to actually fulfill those requests. Yeah, definitely. And this opens up so many doors for different use cases moving forward. Yeah, I think we have a we have a little little video automation uh, here of the user experience. Yep. Yeah. Here you can see when I try to create a time off request there's no data in the cache now and with the click of a button i can go through and and i can real time fetch fetch just my time off types and balances and you can see i can also show and hide components after the time off balances and types load so it's a pretty cool feature of the platform yeah definitely and if you think about it that load took probably hours before yep. and now we can do it within seconds yep. All right, let's talk about adoption and awareness, specifically the the inventory one. And that was that was one of the use cases that we had to address. And, and the platform really allowed us to, to fill this gap and create something quick. So something here that, that I want to point out too, Martin, it was it was kind of cool because we we kind of looked around, right? Because when we first had this idea, there was no this was kind of a homegrown idea and there was no real back end to it. You know, like for Workday, we had an SOR with an API. It didn't take us long to look around and figure out that Podio was a good solution for this because not only does it provide an API out of the box, but a configurable front end where you can kind of drag and drop fields that I want, name them appropriately. And it really was a good marriage between a homegrown solution for a micro app and a back end that would provide that data to that micro app. Because Podio is such a dynamic API and a dynamic interface, to be able to add and remove all of these labels and all of these these fields that we need to we need to persist, we needed to do some modification to the to the response coming out. So we need to just flatten out that structure, the response structure, because again, we really wanted to have some readable schema for the product to easily access the data on the blades, and that was that was really the goal for that. But as far as the use case was concerned, I think the the users really loved it because before they didn't know what was available to them as far as the cat micro app catalog. So if I was in HR, I didn't really know it was available to me until I just looked at the front end. But now I have a micro app where I can see every micro app available to every persona. And not only could they just see it, but they could also request access from the micro app, which is a pretty cool feature. So let's move on to continuous improvement. And this is the phase that we're currently in, um, looking at the solution and, and improving the user experience. If I look at different areas that we're focusing now, it's it definitely looking at the insights. Um, and that's something that we didn't have necessarily when we first went live. We spent a lot of time utilizing the CAS, Citrix Analytics Services data to really understand the usage. Um, currently, we have in our production environment over 80 micro apps installed, various personas. We have 115K on average a month transaction that we see within our implementation. And we continue to look at the different different things, that what works, what are some of the key patterns that, that make micro apps successful. If I was going to pick a few, definitely feed um, within workspace makes a big difference, right? That there's still the awareness gap that we're seeing of, of everyone understanding what's under actions. So that's a big piece. The second piece is business engagement during the development. If we have good engagement and promotion and org readiness, we definitely see a better value from, from the micro apps. The second piece, you know, the, the job is not done. We've done we've done the journey. Um, we need to figure out how do we sustain the idea generation and prioritization, right? So how do we do that? We need to provide channels for users to provide feedback, and we create some solutions for that, utilizing Podio as, as well. Uh, we need to align with the business priorities as well. So we cannot always go and, and ask what micro app do you want. We need to provide that micro app uh, in the context of the particular challenge that the business is trying to solve. And then how do we crowdsource creation of micro apps? I mean, we have a small team, a uh, considerably small team. We can't solve every issue. So we need to make sure we have a framework that allows anybody within an organization to create and a clear path to the deployment. 
And, and a big piece also is to make the micro app really another tool and a tool set of the developers and all the teams, right? So as you're developing and working on the project, there's a lot of requirements about mobile development, mobile apps. This is much easier route to do and develop a mobile experience than it is to create something from scratch on iOS and Android. These are some of the things that we're trying to explore. And Chris, you spent a lot of time on citizen developer framework, right? Kind of of putting that framework together, a lot of sweat and tears, I'm sure there. A lot more sweat and tears than I would have liked to cry out. Marcin had come to me with a with a with a question of how do we engage the community or how can we engage the community and help 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 us help them and vice versa. And so the idea was to put together a center of excellence to to help guide uh, guide the users in in lay out documentation on on how to develop micro apps. So we really came up with the with the concept of a, of a citizen developer framework, and that had three components. And like I talked about before, it had a center of excellence. There was micro apps that allowed uh, users to vote and submit ideas. So they could submit ideas, and then, then the community can vote on them if they, they deem them as valuable to, to them. And then we also have a monthly office hour sync up uh, just to answer any questions and, and, and kind of data mine new ideas and figure out how we can make people's jobs easier. Crowdsourcing was a was a huge a huge part of of the success for the micro app and drive value there. We just work in one department. We don't work in every department and all these departments have different processes and and maybe micro apps there's micro apps out there that that haven't been developed yet that would provide value and save them time in their daily operations. So that was one of the the huge wins for us as, as far as making us successful was leveraging the users and, and their ideas because they have so many good ones. Definitely, and I and I think for the voting submission, we use Podio as a backend as well, right? So. Yeah, so just like we did with the inventory micro app, we we leverage Podio for voting and submissions. Also, it, it was a it was a homegrown idea. It had it had no no backend, and again, Podio was the easy solution to implement this this use case and. The use case provides a lot of value to be able to have users come in, submit an idea, have people vote on it, helps us really prioritize these ideas and, and drive what we should be working on. So yeah, this was a this was a real success for us as far as as far as working and prioritization and making the platform successful. Awesome. Yeah, and I think, you know, if I think about the microapps and, and our journey, and one one key takeaway that I think it, it's very important, right? We talk about use cases, and usually you start with a use case. Um, there's a technical feasibility that we talked about already, right? As far as API availability, you know, data volume, et cetera. But, but the piece that is usually not looked at is the business and process readiness, right? So is the process, is, is, the, is the business ready to really support it? And are there structure to it, right? And, and we, we had few use cases where technically it was feasible, made sense from the business use case, but we're able to deliver. And we really struggle and spend a lot of time going back and forth because the, the data wasn't maintained properly. There was no processes around it. And, and it's hard if something is not developed and the foundation is not solid, it's hard to create micro apps on it. Mm-hmm. So I hope you all enjoy the session. Uh, the purpose again was going through our journey and touched some of the topics. We probably weren't able to go as deep as you would like, but at least hopefully it piqued your interest. And if you have any questions, follow up, ask, uh, and we'll get back to you. Time to take the RV out again. All right, I'm ready for the trip. Thanks, everyone. Ready, thank you.